Hello and welcome to Wrecked, the Michael Rechtenwald podcast. In, t- in honor of today's guest, I'll begin by quoting a passage I wrote a couple weeks ago. Let the NPCs live imprisoned in 15-minute cities under constant surveillance, wearing masks and submitting to endless useless vaccines or worse. Let them survive on UBI issued in CBDC with digital IDs that track their every move from cradle to grave. Let them forego real meat and eat synthetic meat, toxic vegetables, and bugs. Let them submit to smart city technologies that track their carbon footprints and issue their social credit scores so they feel like good compliant citizens. Let them have their Marxism, critical race theory, transgenderism, and servility to the ever burgeoning state. Let them think that they are radicals while they serve as the foot soldiers and accomplices of the globalist elite. It's time to separate from these people. No reconciliation is possible. The only question is whether the totalitarians they serve will let us out. My guest today is Tom Woods. Tom is a senior fellow of the Mises Institute and the author of a dozen books, including the New York Times bestseller, Politically Incorrect, God, The Politically Incorrect Guide to History, and Meltdown on the Financial Crisis. His book, The Church and the Market, A Catholic Defense of the Free Economy, won the $50,000 prize in the Templeton Enterprise Awards. Uh, Tom's articles have appeared in dozens of popular and scholarly periodicals, and his books have been translated into dozens of languages. Tom hosts the Tom Woods Show, a Liberty podcast that releases a new episode every weekday. Hello and welcome to Rec Tom. Glad to be here, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm My an pleasure. avid reader. I'm glad of you have a show, and I'm glad it's called Wrecked. Was that your idea? Yes, it was. Yes. <laughs> That's great. I had some, a little bit of pushback on that name, not from the Mises Institute, but from my son who thought it was too much, but I, I went with it anyway. No, never. It was, uh, I think it's brilliant. Oh, uh, thanks. So uh, I'm an avid reader of your newsletter. Um, I read it every day, and uh, I just want to make one comment about it. And that is something you probably don't hear very often. For example, uh, you're an excellent writer. Your newsletters uh, and other writing uh, are consistently excellent. You take complex ideas and make them crystal clear. I don't think a lot of people really understand how hard that is to do. Anyway, that's well, something I just wanted that to is, say. That is high praise coming from, from an author like you, Michael. So thank you. Oh, and I enjoy doing it. I, lo- I love it. And, and in a way... It's kind of like what I used to do in high school when I used to be a math tutor. I was the math tutor they sent all the athletes who were in danger of academic disqualification to because they figured if Woods can't fix this this student, then forget it. And all I did was I just explained the math the way I wish somebody had explained it to me. And I yeah. would consistently get people saying, well, if they had explained it like this, I would have gotten it. And so I've taken that and just applied it. You know, wherever I mean, because obviously there are a lot of complicated issues out there, like in in economics and beyond. And so I just think, okay, well, I would have found it a lot clearer if people had said X. So I just say X from the start. Absolutely, I, I had the same sort of uh, experience teaching writing in the university. Basically, I was not the smartest, you know, most brilliant professor in the world, and so it helped me actually teach people because I can see where they might not understand something because I struggled. To understand things, so uh, that helps, I think, great de- a great deal in teaching and in writing. Uh, it helps to know where people are coming from to make sense of things for them, because, uh, as you said, there's a lot of complex issues, especially in connection with uh, with uh, with uh, libertarianism. So you boil it down so well, and for that, I I, re- I really appreciate that. Thank you. So. I want to note a common theme in some of your recent newsletters, which I I find fascinating and uh, something that I think about myself quite a bit, and that is you've uh, highlighted the possibility that rather than mere incompetence in terms of these uh, these elites, of these uh, so-called elites, this regime, you know, we may be dealing with something else. You know, perhaps we're dealing with malevolence and nefarious intent. 
Um, you know, these state actors, for example, and their accomplices locked us down, wrecked the economy, shred the social fabric, caused increased suicide rates, forced vaccinations on people, and pre precipitated inflation. Are they just incompetent or are they, are they evil? Uh, that seems to be something you've grappled with in recent writing. Could you talk about that a little bit? I'm, I'm moving away from, I guess, the maybe naive view I used to have which I look back on now uh, with a bit of a smirk, because I, I used to think this was a matter of, well, these people just don't understand economics. But, you know, it uh, can only go so long without picking up some economics, you know, by osmosis or something, uh, you know, or not noticing that everything you do makes things worse. I mean, you, and, and, you know, I, I think back to what some of my friends have told me over the years, which was <clears throat> if we were dealing just with honest mistakes by good faith actors, then you would think by accident they would occasionally do the right thing. But yet, especially in recent years, it's consistently one wicked thing after another, one thing after another that would make your life worse over and over and over again. And I think that the key to, to this insight is remembering that very rarely does an evil regime announce we're doing the following things to make you miserable because we're an evil regime. They're never going to say that. What are they going to say? We're doing these things for your health. We're doing these things for your well-being. We're doing these things because the earth will be destroyed if we don't do them. I mean, come on. Of course that's how they're going to talk. And then you think, right. well, if I were designing a system that was intended to entrench the elites and, make the, and, and really grind the average person's nose in it, what kinds of things would I do? And it's pretty much exactly what they're doing. So I, I, I think at this point, especially after what they did for several years with lockdowns, restrictions, um, mandates of various kinds, I don't think these people deserve the benefit of the doubt. I think my, my natural uh, inclination is to assume malevolence now until proven otherwise. And that's not my fault. That's because of their track record yeah. of acting like this. Yeah, I mean, they're going to call us conspiracy theorists for this, uh, and this is their typical epithet to throw at everybody that reposes this. Right, uh, and, and not to mention, they're all doing the same thing. I mean, okay, we had the exception of Sweden, Belarus, I suppose. I mean, here and there you found some exceptions, but they were all pretty much doing exactly the same thing. And what, this was all just a coincidence, that they, they all just did exactly the same thing? Maybe it is a coincidence. Sometimes people do the exact, exactly the same thing, and it's just a coincidence. Yeah. But I think about the example of Lori Lightfoot, who was a former uh, mayor of Chicago. Now she's got a position as a fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. And think about what is it that she's got the, the fellowship in? Leadership and health. Now, health, yeah. forget about it, because all she did was repeat all the stuff that hurt people. But leadership, her, quote, leadership consisted of doing exactly what every other blue state mayor did. And that was leadership. Yeah. No, the real, real leadership would be those dissident governors who said, I think there's something wrong with Fauci and we're going to do something different. That's leadership. Her leadership yeah. was doing exactly what everybody else did. And in this crazy world, that's supposed to be leadership. I'm sorry, but I smell a rat there. Yeah, these people seem to fail upwards. I mean, you know how this happens that no matter what they do, in fact, the, the worse they do, the, the more they get promoted. Uh, you know, look at Pete Buttigieg and, and uh, Lori Lightfoot, as you said, and others. Uh, but speaking of leaders, um, recently, and uh, you're not alone in this amongst uh, libertarians, I think, you've expressed some agreement with and support I'm not saying you're going to vote for him, but you've, you've expressed some support for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, what do you like about him? Well, there are some things I don't like about him and that, that have also actually emerged in recent days and weeks. But the thing is, given the things he's good on, it's, I, can, I, I don't know if I want to say I can overlook other things, but yeah, maybe I can overlook other things because he's so good on so many things that matter. Like, I, I sometimes think about somebody like Bill Weld, you know, former governor of Massachusetts, uh, Libertarian Party vice presidential candidate. I mean, this guy is a stuffed shirt if you ever saw one. And maybe he's good on some wonkish policy thing or whatever, but, but I think about um, issues that have affected me 
very, very dramatically having to do with uh, health, so-called public health, which I, I can't utter the, the expression of the term public health any longer without having contemptuous quotation marks around, around those words. But uh, mat- <clears throat> matters like that, the military-industrial complex. Could you imagine Bill Weld talking about the military-industrial complex? Not possible. Mm-hmm. It would never, ever, ever happen. Um, right. The surveillance state, um, he, he um, I, as far as I can see, wants to pardon... Uh, you know, he's, he says he's looking into the matter of Ross Ulbricht, so he's not as good as Vivek Ramaswamy, who says he would um, give clemency to all of them. But Snowden and uh, Assange, there's no justification for what's been done to them. Uh, mm-hmm. These are the kinds of people who uh, are unfashionable in media circles and unfashionable in mainstream politics, but they have a champion in this guy who also... Uh, I think it's great to hear a voice on the Democratic left saying, you know, maybe shutting down society might have hurt the most vulnerable people we have, which should be obvious to the world. But uh, we spent three years pretending it wasn't to have that kind of a voice out there. I, I mean, I don't know if any sane people are still in the Democratic Party, but I bet some people are just by inertia. And I bet some of them do have the kind of instincts of an RFK, but they don't dare say anything because they've been told that that's wrong and they're grandma killers and whatever. So to have somebody like that uh, in in that kind of position, I think, is 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 very helpful and important. I think the the worst things that that I associate with him, which is some of the worst environmentalism. Well, he would need a compliant Congress for most of that. But most of the things that he would want to do that I agree with are things that can be done on the president's own say so. So I, you know, I, again, I, I don't know if I'm, you know, where my vote would go or all that, but to hear a voice like this, yes, yes, I'm, I'm all too aware of, of his, of his problems, but he could activate some, some dormant voices in his party that might help bring some sanity back. I, I don't have much long-term hope for the Democrats, but I feel like they're at war with everything I cherish. So anybody throwing a monkey wrench into the works of that is to be encouraged. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, when they, they told him, they being the Democratic Party of New Hampshire, don't you speak at the event that the uh, Free State Project is holding, at Porkfest, don't you speak there, because those right. are terrible, cra- crazy extremists, they would say. Um, you should do X, Y, and Z. Some people would have uh, buckled and, right. and would have said, uh, okay, I'm sorry, what a big mistake. Please accept my apology. Instead, he told them to go stick it. He said, I am sick and tired of the kind of people who run the New York, uh, the, uh, the New Hampshire Republican Party, uh, the Democratic Party. I am sick and tired of these people, and they're, they're telling me what I can and can't do and people I can and can't talk to. I'm, I'm not going to be told who I can and can't talk to. I'm going to talk to anybody I darn well please. That's a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, what do you think about the, uh, the re- recent reason slashing of him, uh, their trashing of him and... Uh, their podcast, uh, in a podcast, and then I think in an article as well, um, on, on, you know, for effectively saying, look, I think the, uh, the people that are running things are, are wicked. I mean, what they're doing is wicked. And he just, uh, you know, and, and for that, they, they said that he was garbage, you know, that he's crazy, that he's some kind of a conspiracy theorist. Right. Now, they did do an interview with him, and I heard some people saying they didn't like the way the interview went. But then I went and saw it, and I thought it wasn't actually so bad, and that they gave him time to defend himself. And incidentally, I'll say in parentheses, that's another notable thing about him, is that when you give him a while to give him time to explain himself, he can give you long explanations with citations and and names of journal articles and the year they were published and, and whatever. And uh, you know, look, if we had somebody on our side uh, who was that prominent in public life, who could debate like that, and who, could, who had the facts and figures at the ready, this would be a very different country, I'm convinced. So, so he's yeah. very, very good with stuff like that. So you mentioned my newsletter. Well, my newsletter yeah. is where I actually did write a little something about this. And you can get it. TomWoods.com is where you can get it, right at the top of the page. You also get a free ebook because who would I be if I weren't giving away a free ebook along with the subscription of the newsletter? But it's newsletter is free, the ebook is free. But I did write a little something about a uh, an editorial video made by now I can't remember her name. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. But some mm-hmm. some writer there, 
And when I read what some of the criticisms are, I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing. That one of the mm-hmm. criticisms was, he says the establishment is corrupt at best and evil at worst. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yeah, okay, so, I mean, what, what would the establishment need to do more than it has done already to demonstrate that it does not have your best interests at heart uh, and that it is evil, at the very, very least corrupt, but at worst evil? And I, and I just thought... Who in the libertarian world, like, why are you in the libertarian world if you think we have a basically okay establishment uh, staffed by pretty good, well-meaning people? They just need a few economics lessons. I, I don't think I would bother. I think I would just be happy that I live in a, in a, you know, a just society with sensible and smart people running it. I, I, I don't think I would care as much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just astounding that they, um, that they would pick him up on such a thing and that they would suggest that he is uh, dangerous just because he, he finds problems with corruption, which is endemic to the whole structure. Um, you know, he is a standard welfare state liberal, you might yeah. say. I, I, I mean, and he's also, you know, what we might call a climate change conspiracy theorist to throw one of their epithets back in their faces. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you find terribly, tru- terribly te- truly terrible about his views? Well, the other day, the New York Post misquoted uh, him or, or, uh, or um, gave people a false impression about one of his opinions. And in response to that, he's gone way overboard talking about his devotion to Israel and mm-hmm. his dedication to the state of Israel. And right. this goes to show I'm not an anti-Semite. And it was a, a, a really pathetic display. That you, and you would think he would be above that. But it goes to show, as, as outspoken and tough as he can be, there's only one Ron Paul in this world. Right, absolutely. Um, let's move on to something else. Uh, recently, uh, Yaron uh, Brook, the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute, condemned you, Tom Woods, in a podcast calling you anti-American and morally relativist. I don't know how he could uh, call you the latter unless that is American foreign policy is considered absolutely correct no matter what, and any opposition must be deemed morally relativist. It seems that the ARI has taken the worst views of Rand, particularly her conflating of the liberty movement with U.S. militarism, and magnified them. Do you have any additional thoughts on, on this condemnation and this institute? Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm. I have zero concern about it. Um, <laughs> I wrote about it because you know I write a daily newsletter, and this was like red meat. It was just like a. This is like a big old meatball right over the plate, for, you know, for me to hit. Yeah. So I. So I did it, but, t- but, the, it seems like at least with with them, the institutionalization of objectivism has not led to good results. Uh, and it has led to, uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know, how, I don't know how to characterize it really, but I, I realized when this happened that it was 15 years ago that I wrote a blog entry at lewrockwell.com criticizing these exact people for their views yeah. on foreign policy. And in particular for their views on uh, arguing that it, sh- that, that, Countries that, that uh, like like the U.S. that stand for quote individual rights should not feel constrained in their in the way they conduct warfare when it comes to innocent civilian populations. They are right. to blame those people in those countries. They are to blame because and, and they live in quote terrorist countries, which is a complete. Th- these are supposed to be anti collectivist thinkers. That's a collectivist concept. The idea of a quote terrorist country. And so we can, do, we can do what we want because our regime is enforcing individual rights. And it seems to me that's moral relativism. You know, we can, we can carry out all sorts of moral enormities, but mm-hmm. because we're doing it in the, in the name of this, that, or the other thing. And, and half the time we're, we are doing it in the name of um, imperial ambition, uh, enriching fat cats, and, and, you know, it's very quaint to see the, um, the, 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 the sweet, naive people at the Ayn Rand Institute think 
that when the U.S. government explains why it's doing something, it's always giving you the true explanation. It's to fight for democracy and yeah. this, that, and the other thing, and individual rights. And they just jump right on board for that. Absolutely. That is what it is all about. And you think, geez, what? How much clearer could these people make it that this is not what drives them, especially when you look at the regimes they choose to wrangle with and the regimes they, um, you know, they coddle doesn't seem to leave a very distinct pattern, <laughs> you know. But so, right. so to, to hear this, to hear them taking this all at face value uh, and then having taken it all at face value, never once talking about the military-industrial complex, the problems there, the incentives there, not once, uh, but, but then uh, is suggesting that we could just absolutely lay waste. We could use nuclear weapons if we wanted to against um, a foe. Uh, again, to me, that, it looks like that's moral relativism, that, well, if, as long as the U.S. government says it's okay, then incinerating all those people is fine. Now, you as a private individual probably shouldn't go incinerate people, but if the U.S. regime is doing it, we know they have good intentions because go look at read the Constitution for yourself. Ugh, I mean, it's like I, I, I think one article is all I need for this. Yeah, I, I guess they also support the uh, proxy war in Ukraine. Well, of course. Uh, and, I mean, with, if the establishment yeah. tells them jump, they say how high. Yeah. Well, it does throw the uh, Mises Institute into relief with that. I mean, it, in fact, it shows the difference between objectivism as practiced, at least today, and uh, libertarianism as uh, upheld by the Mises Institute. That uh, we don't, uh, the Mises Institute in particular doesn't, uh, doesn't fall for this kind of uh, militarism and it doesn't fall for this kind of uh, defense of the regime at all costs and uh right and at, at the cost of all principles and by the way i say this as somebody who rather likes ayn rand um mm -hmm. i you know obviously as with anybody um you know i i'm i have some disagreements some major some minor but the some of the things she did were very very impressive her nonfiction, which most people overlook is really really biting and devastating but in in her fiction she's got um, in Atlas Shrugged, the passage about the 20th Century Motor Company. And at this yeah. company, they were going to implement, actually in the functioning of their company, the principle from each according to his ability to each according to his need. And that yeah. sounds like a very noble principle. But as you watch it unfold, as somebody, she's, she's telling us this story through the voice of a worker who worked at the 20th Century Motor Company. And you watch it unfold and you realize every stage of this unfolding horror is completely plausible. This is exactly how it would go. And I find it to be such a convincing passage that, okay, yeah. I suppose it's, it's my next daughter's turn now, I, I realize, but I have been reading this passage to each daughter of mine as they get old enough to mm. understand it, because I believe this one story alone is enough to inoculate you against this kind of stuff. This one, it is so compellingly written. So now, Amy Woods, it's your turn for Dad to read you the 20th mm -hmm. Century Motor Company passage from Atlas Shrugged. It's absolutely great. So I don't go into, it's not that I'm going into this, I don't like Ayn Rand. I think, I, I think, I think she was right. a, a very, very impressive woman. Yeah, absolutely, and very prescient as well, because the, we're seeing this being implemented, this kind, of, uh, this kind of philosophy within companies now with the stakeholder capitalism and the ESG index. This is actually happening as we speak. And, uh, of so course, that's very... she, and, and she in some ways indirectly anticipated the kind of question you opened this conversation up with, which is, are we dealing with stupid or evil? Because she, right. w she would say, given that we know that market economies have lifted more people out of poverty than any force anywhere in the world, if we have people who claim they want to help the poor, but they don't support the free market, uh, I don't see why we automatically assume these are people of goodwill. Because the, the solution right. to your problem is staring you in the face and you can't even be bothered to look, look for it, then maybe there's something else motivating you. It could be envy, it could be a, a lust for destruction, it could be a desire to, to rule, to rule over people, Wh whatever it is, right, it ain't right, uh, right. your pure desire to uplift them from poverty. 
at least willful ignorance is evil. Um, we might say that it, uh, they may willfully uh, resist the facts, resist history, uh, resist the, what we can see as clearly the case, and effectively institute these things anyway, uh, because it's a kind of willful, willful ignorance, uh, at least, at, at, at the best. And, and on the other hand, it might be uh, something else at worst. Yeah. Uh, so, um, now, I know you didn't want to talk about your forthcoming book, but I just thought I'd ask one question about it. It's, it's entitled Diary of a Psychosis, How Public Health Disgrates Itself during, the co during COVID mania. Um, can you give any preview as to what this might be about? Yeah, I mean, there are already books on COVID, so I initially thought I'm not going to do one. And uh, my last book came out nine years ago, and I kind of thought I was retired from this. Because it's hard work writing a book. You know that, Michael Rechtenwald. It's hard work. And yes. being in promotional mode all the time is, is rough. You know, I mean, it's, you don't make a lot of money on each particular book. You know, you're talking like a few, few dollars. And yet you've got to be promoting it at every possible opportunity. I mean, I'm just exhausted from this. I don't want to do it. So I decided, ah, I don't want to yeah. do it. It's a lot of work. I don't want to do it. But then I realized, wait a minute. I've read a lot of good books on COVID. But the one thing they're missing is one thing that I actually have. And that comes from the fact that, as you say, I've written this weekday newsletter, and I wrote it. Uh, of course, I continued writing it all through the COVID times. And that meant that the manuscript I have has a diary kind of vibe to it. Because instead mm. of making generalities, I'm walking you through this day they did this, and then they did this, and then they did this. So kind of building the dystopia day by day. Now, not every single day. That would the book would be unwieldy, but the key entries, in effect, like diary entries, I've yeah. brought together into this manuscript. And the idea is that even those of us like you and me who followed this pretty carefully, I can tell you, I forgot 75% of the crazy stuff they did until I went yeah. back and looked at what I wrote. And I thought, oh my gosh, I forgot they said this and they said that. And so this captures some of the madness that has kind of fallen between our fingers, captures it for in perpetuity for posterity. It captures it in a book forever, uh, some of the madness. But, but more right. than that, every day, or, or let's say a lot of the days, I would look at a chart or two charts, and it would compare a place that was doing X to a place that was not doing X. And it would compare places that were demographically identical. So you can't say, oh, well, this one is uh, right. you know, less sickly than this one or, or, or whatever it is, whatever the excuse is. You can't do that because these, are the, these people are identical. The only difference between them is one of them has a mask mandate and one doesn't, or one of them has a vaccine mandate and one doesn't. So let's compare them and just see what the results were. And you can see that there is no connection whatsoever between anything they did and any of the results. And that, that surprised even me because I was initially thinking the way I'd have to argue this is, well, yeah, they may have had some good consequences, but there were some terrible side effects too. I don't even have to argue it like that. There were no good consequences. And, 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 and you, think, you think I'm exaggerating. The presentation in this book is absolutely relentless. It, it is relentless. By the end of it, if you are a person with an open mind, a person of goodwill, there's no way you can accept uh, for a minute any of the standard narrative. Now, I realize that when I talk to this audience or, or related audiences, that some people listening will say, look, this was never about a, quote, virus. This was never about health. It was always about control. So it doesn't matter mm -hmm. for, you, for you to bother pointing out that this policy didn't work. is isn't even the point. They, whether it worked or not was not what was driving them. Well, I don't know if I'm entirely that cynical, but even if I were, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. point is there are – there got to be a hundred million Americans who think these things either did work or were supposed to work. They absolutely believe that. Yeah. And so before you start telling them, oh, by the way, it's lizard people who are running the world, <laughs> I do think that step one is showing them none of the stuff worked. That is the first step. Well, if none of the stuff yeah. worked, then that gets them thinking in productive ways. Well, then why did we stick to it for so long or whatever? But or, or are these people as competent as we think? Or should I listen to these people in the future? Or should I listen to them on other things? It gets them thinking in, in very productive ways to first establish that the stuff didn't work. And yes, I know that producing charts is not going to convince uh, Joe Biden not to do this again in the future. I'm not trying to convince Joe Biden. I'm trying to convince average Joe American 
who doesn't quite know what to think. He does feel like some of it seems like BS, but all the official sources tell him it was the right thing to do, so he doesn't quite know what to think. I want to tell him, Joe American, you're right to be skeptical of this, and here's the evidence. That's what I'm trying to accomplish with this book, and that's not nothing. No, that's, that's a big task, and it's very important to capture the historical record, and you did it in a journaling-type fashion, which you know, details it day by day, uh, which will then give people you know, a, a chronicle of, of the, it'll be a kind of COVID chronicle uh, uh, that pits the narrative against you know, reality. I think that's hugely important. In fact, thank you, Michael. Um, In fact, let me add one more thing, because I've decided that I'm going to give away a volume two of this book for free to anybody who asks for it. It'll be electronic version, but it'll be for anybody who asks for it, full-length book. And this one is going to be called COVID Stories. And I don't remember offhand okay. the exact, exact wording of my subtitle, but it's all those people. I have it here. It's COVID. Yeah. Oh, tell me. It's, tell me what my subtitle yeah, is, Michael. It's COVID stories, victims of the lockdown regime speak out. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Because as, as you know, having, we all lived through this, that you were not exactly encouraged to talk about ways in which the lockdowns damaged your business or your health or your kids' lives or whatever. That was not allowed because if you, if you question any of this, there's something wrong with you mentally, you want to see people die, whatever. But these people have some stories to tell. And if we're going to tell the full story of this tale, it has to include those stories. If historians in the yeah. future are going to tell this tale, it has to include yeah. those, the kinds of stories that the New York Times did not follow up on. So what I'm going to be, I, it's not set up yet, but I'll have a website for the book. And on that website, I'll say, by the way, uh, if you buy this book and you'd like the second volume, all you got to do is, you know, just get it right here. And so what I've done is I've made an appeal to people on my newsletter list, and I've said, mm -hmm. if you are one of these people who has a story of deprivation and sadness and loss caused by these yeah. measures themselves, then please submit it to me and tell me if you want me to use your name with it or not. I mean, I prefer to use names, but I, I can have a handful of entries that will be anonymous for obvious reasons, but I'd like to compile a book of these stories. So anybody listening to this now, if that's you, and, and this, these stories can take any form, if it involved avoidable human suffering, then just send it to me. You can, if you go to TomWoods.com, you'll see at the top there's a contact page. I receive those like an email. Just, just submit it to me right in there, and I'll get back to you and thank you for it. Um, but it, but I, I bet people listening right now, you know what I'm talking about. You know about people who committed suicide, or even lesser things like that uh, than that, people who were ostracized at work, or lost friends, or whatever it is, or, or your father died alone, or whatever the story is, I'd like to have it to put in this book that I'm going to be giving away. I make no money on this. It's just somebody's got to compile these stories. So just send me your story, tomwoods.com, on the contact page. Yeah, that's excellent. And one of the stories you, you included in one of your newsletters, it was a I think a young woman in Boston, yeah. I forget what her career was, but she was also a sufferer of, you know, bipolar disorder and, uh, and uh, had been on a, you know, medical regime uh, and uh, had been stabilized for, I guess, years or, or you know, for some period of time. And, uh, and thanks to the COVID uh, lockdown regime, you know, basically went spiraling out of, uh, out of control. Yeah, yeah and, the gains uh, she had made a, started to be lost. And, and I mean, I thought from the very beginning that people who really, really are suffering with depression or uh, related uh, types of things, this yeah. social distancing thing is a death sentence for them. And even if it doesn't mean their physical deaths, it means a kind of death uh, in, in what's being asked of them. Absolutely. And I think to, to show stories of people like that or who are vulnerable to begin with, I think it's very important because that's... That's the kind of people that actually exist out there, and we shouldn't pretend like they don't. It's and, funny, uh, Michael, I went back and looked through old copies of my newsletter, and one of them said, um, somebody should write a book called COVID Stories, and I thought, here I am doing it. Oh, I knew wow. this was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I often take hints from, from uh, people on social media without them knowing it, you know, and uh, actually they give me a lot of ideas for 
you know, what kind of topics to plumb and research. Well, I try to give them credit for it, but you can't really give credit to everybody. It becomes, you know, too difficult. So I yeah. thank them basically globally. I, I thank them globally for everything they've suggested. And I think, you know, we all, we, we both have probably uh, benefited from such comments. Oh, absolutely. Uh, ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's got to be, I have to, there has to be some upside to putting up with Twitter. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. I, I got to get something absolutely. out of this. Uh it's, yeah, absolutely. It's terrible generally, and uh, I'm I'm still basically a shadow band there, suppressed in many ways. But I continue to use it for, you know, just giving the outside chance that I might break through with something in terms of what I'm trying to get across. Well, the thing uh, is, even if you, even if you curate your following in such a way that you're you're, you're following only interesting people or. Um, people with good manners or people who you, you feel are gonna, whose message is going to be uplifting. The problem is some of those people occasionally interact with not such good people and their interactions right. will show up in your feed. And like, and then I get, yeah. because of my temperament, I get drawn into them because I can't just, you know, people say just scroll past easier said than done when you're me. Right. I hear you. I'm, I'm the same way. I can't, I, I the, the, the trolls get me almost every time. I know, uh, and I, I want to pretend that they don't, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, speaking of such, you know, I, I'd like to move a little bit towards a more, pri- uh, you know, some more about your private professional life. What, what amazes me is how much you do. It, it's so prodigious that I, I'm, I'm just in awe. And I would ask you about the secret of your success, except that it's not a secret. You publicize and share all, all this regularly with your school of life and other efforts. And I'm, st- I'm still amazed at your prodigious output. Uh, can you tell us, like, what is your daily routine? How do people follow in your footsteps? Which I think many should, and I don't mean by being you per se, but following in your habitus. You know, how do you manage to do all this incredible work, uh, especially under current conditions? Uh, you know, um, but I, I recommend people being as entrepreneurial as possible, and uh, it's one of the recommendations in my recent most book because you don't want to be working for these institutions that can cancel you on a dime. Yeah. So how do, how, do, how do they do that in short? I know you have whole programs set up to address this question, but I, and I think it's an important thing that you've added to the movement, and that is not just theory. People, You're telling people about practice and how they can improve their lives directly, not simply by knowing the correct theory of the state and, uh, and uh, the correct economic principles, but what, what they can do uh, to improve their lives. So can you just kind of give us a brief? Yeah, sure. I'll do a little something about that and a little something about time management and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I, did, yeah. I did launch something in February 2022 called the Tom Woods School of Life. The, uh, the name for that was given to me by a guy named Jay Abraham. If you look him up, he is one of the top uh, executive coaches in the world. And he, mm. he came up with the idea for the whole thing. And it was that, Tom, I think your followers know an awful lot about libertarianism now, and there's nothing wrong. That's great. And you should, for if the sake of your intellectual pleasure, you should learn more and more. But he said, I, I, I bet the kind of things keeping them up at night are not, I need more information about the non-aggression principle, or I need more about yeah. George Washington. Was he a good military strategist or not? I mean, like, yeah, you can get that information if you really need it. But the kinds of things keeping my people up at night are, um, you know, like I've I got to educate my kids in a world that hates me. How, how am I going to do that? And when, especially when they feel like they can't homeschool, they haven't got the time. Um, that there are alien ideologies that want to colonize their kids' minds. They keep that keeps them up. Or my my money loses its purchasing power, but all I hear in the libertarian world is buy gold. But that can't possibly be the full strategy. So what right. what am I actually? What practical thing am I supposed to do? Or I don't particularly fancy trying to go back on the job market when I'm 55. So I'd like to learn how to how to run my own little business, but I don't know where to begin and I have no budget for this. So w- what do I do? So it's practical things, one practical thing after another. I've had a hostage negotiator on to talk about how to get what you want from other people. That's a practical skill to know. So every th- single thing we've talked about is a practical thing. So we've, or, or during COVID, we were talking about um, which states should you move to? 
And so I mm. had uh, prominent people from a number of states come on and make the pitch for their state. And then I published a report on how to how to relocate on a budget. Maybe uh, maybe that state or that city is crushing your soul, but you can't leave because you don't have the money. So all sorts of things like that we cover. And but it's not just that we it's not like a series of recordings. The idea of it is the the main value proposition is what we call the accountability groups. We break into groups of 10 to 15 people virtually. And these groups are on different topics, fitness. So we have people trying to lose weight, uh, business and Mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, people trying to start or grow businesses. Um, We have a tech group. We have all different sort of, we have a women's group and they meet every week. And each person talks about, well, here's what I'm working on. And here's what I'm having trouble with. And then everybody else gives advice and, or helps them make connections. Oh, I know somebody who could help you with this. And then at the end of the session, at the end, people say, all right, well, my goal for next week is to do this particular finite thing. And that goal mm-hmm. setting makes people, you don't want to show up and tell all your friends, oh, I, I'm a bum and I didn't do it. It keeps you moving forward. Sometimes when you work on mm-hmm. a project by yourself and you, you hit a snag, you just give up on it. But this group is going to keep you on that path to, to, to reaching that goal. And so, uh, example, the guy who runs the, the uh, Kevin Dolan's the guy who runs our, our groups, and he says, um, he had a guy in a fitness group and every, he, he was consistent. He showed up every single week. And every single week he was there to report how badly he was doing. It was, oh, I ate some cookies. It was somebody's wedding and I had some cake or whatever it was. But after eight months, who had lost by far the most weight? It was that guy. Because mm. just showing up and being accountable. So what I'm trying to do is say, there are so many areas of your life where you could enjoy freedom where you could enjoy fulfillment right now, whether or not Joe Biden is in office, but you got to do something. And, and one thing is working with other people who have the same worldview you have, who are cheering you on, who have knowledge you don't have. You have something to contribute. They have something to contribute. There's a synergy here. And so to me, this is the most fulfilling thing that I do these days. So that site is TomSchoolOfLife.com. That's that site. But in terms of how do I accomplish a lot of things, yeah, I mean, I write a newsletter every weekday to two different lists. I have a, an uh, entrepreneurship list, and I have just a libertarian list. And I write to them basically every day. Occasionally, I miss a day, but that's because I'm a father of five, and things come up, and I'm not going to reproach my, You know, what are you paying for the newsletter, right? It's for free. So I, I do that, and I have all these podcast episodes, and I, then I have to monitor and stay on top of these memberships that I have, like the School mm-hmm. of Life and Liberty Classroom, whatever. Mm-hmm. So the way I've, I've started to do it is, is to just – is to break it up into, into particular days. So, so what I'm going to start doing in the future is – I haven't told anybody this, but I'm going to scale the Tom Woods show back to three episodes a week, but have video on them now. Have video. I can't do have somebody do video editing for five episodes. It's just not possible. But instead of making them right. so short, maybe have each one be closer to 45 minutes to an hour. So it'll still be the same amount of output. But it's hard to do five episodes a week and not have some of them just be throwaways. You know, I don't want to do that. I want to have them all be worthwhile. So my goal would be Monday I do my episodes. So the, the podcast is done for the week. Then Tuesday I go to the beach. I'm super productive at the beach. I don't know why. Super productive. Wow. And I just write as many emails as I possibly can that day, finishing them up the next day. So that two and a half day, halfway into my week, I've done all the newsletters and I've done all the podcast episodes. Now I can spend some time on, what, uh, monitoring the forum at the School of Life or figuring out which experts I should bring in and talk about what topics. Get all that squared away. Uh, Stay on top of my email inbox because I, I can't answer everybody who writes to me. But some people are writing to me about you know, business-related things that I've got to respond to. And then at the very least, that leaves Friday for if I want to start a brand new project or work on something or well, whatever, I have Friday to do that. And if it's a super crazy week, then Friday is just my catch-up day. So that's the way I, I, I kind of want to do it. And, and by doing it that way, because right now or, or, or up till recently, I would do like a little bit of everything every single day. But I feel like getting in the groove of, of one thing, I'm much more productive with it. And then also, it, it absolutely is true that working in like 30 to 40 minute chunks, it, I, I'm much more efficient. And then I take a break. Maybe I do a few chess puzzles. I get a snack. But I just focus. Well, I shut everything else off. I focus. In fact, sometimes I'm working on the newsletter and I say, look, I got to get this done in 25 minutes. So I literally set a timer. And when yeah. that timer is going, there's something in that brain that makes me 
uh, more efficient. And, and 25 minutes down the road, I have got that newsletter done. I mean, you have to come up with the topics every day. This is what amazes me is that you That's have hard. these topics. Yeah. But I get, uh, so I'll you tell you be... the secret. If you want to know the secret, I, I do yeah. get, not all of them, because some of them are just things I see in the news and I say, oh, I got to comment on that. But other times yeah. it's Twitter. And what I've done is I've, yeah. I've, I've curated a list and I'd like to make it bigger. But right now it's 20 people that I follow who put out consistently interesting things uh, or share interesting news items. And some of these give me ideas for the newsletter. That really is, is where, where I get a lot of it. But I'm not That's sharing that list with anybody. That's private. That's uh, proprietary. I, I take it I'm not on that list, Tom. <laughs> oh, you're on the list, Michael Rechtenwald. You are. You are on the list. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good to know. As is Tho uh, Bishop, also at the Mises Institute. Tho is on the list, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tho's yeah. great. Um, yeah. He's, he's doing some in, incredibly good work, and yeah. uh, his writing is, is really stellar. Uh, I don't have a heck of a lot more to uh, add, Tom, I just, but I do want to say this. Uh, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to publicly thank you uh, for everything you do, uh, in particular, in my case, what you've done for me. You were the one who introduced me to the libertarian community in both senses of that phrase. That is, you invited me into the uh, liberty movement by having me on your podcast several times, and you've recommended me as a speaker for the Mises Institute and introduced me to the libertarian audience, but also you've introduced me to classic libertarian texts uh, you've also invited me to produce courses for your excellent educational venture, libertyclassroom.com. And so for all of that and more, I, I owe you a deep debt of gratitude. And I just wanted to make this public while we're talking here. Well, that is a very generous thing of you to do, Michael, and I appreciate that. And I've been very, very glad to do all those things. I remember the first time I told Joe Salerno about you, I was almost giddy. Joe, wait till you see this guy. <laughs> He's the, you're going you're gonna to love this guy. <laughs> so I was yeah. very, very happy to do it. But, but you know what? At the same time, Michael, thank you because you stepped into a void. I mean, you didn't know what life had in store for you when you decided, I'm making a break with positions I've held for a long time and people I've yeah. been associated with. I'm making a break. That is a very, very scary uh, and bold and courageous move. So... I would say uh, thank you right back to you. Oh, that's great. Thank I appreciate that. Yeah, it wasn't easy, and I don't want to make this about me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that uh, that was tough. And, and I got to say that I, I found, you know, the Liberty community to be amazing, and uh, I found it to be, you know, so receptive. And I didn't know everything when I came over here. I didn't know uh, all, you know, I hadn't read Rothbard. I had read some Mises. I had read some Hayek and, and others. But I hadn't read uh, Hoppe and I hadn't, you know, so there was a lot that I had to learn. And so it was very disoriented and dizzying. And you helped me to gain some sense of orientation through that. And uh, that, uh, that I just wanted to acknowledge. I, I'm very grateful to you for that. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming on, Tom. I appreciate it. And uh, if, did you want to give us any last words about how people can get on your newsletter list or how they can find you and uh, your podcast and so yeah, forth? Yeah, sure. TomWoods.com is the, is the pivot point for everything I do. So TomWoods.com is what I would recommend people uh, check out. Great. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Mike. You're listening to Wrecked with Michael Rechtenwald. Find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts and get more content like this on Mises.org.